maybe of folks um, who have participated and do already do urban agriculture in ways far beyond what I do if they want to sort of add in their own two cents about um, why urban agriculture. Did that work? D? Um, well, I was looking at um, the work that you've been doing at, at Hillside yeah. in terms of like the, the fostering of that, uh, I guess, the greater investment. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> With the work that you're doing in Hillside Court with connecting the community to healthy uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, my question is how, uh, what has been instrumental in terms of getting people invested in the conversation, even beyond just that charity piece behind somebody just coming to bring food behind people, uh, more so egging or engaging people around participating in the process in a more uh, hands-on way? Sure, that's a really good question. And with a staff of, of just two like ours, um, and again, soon to be a little bit bigger, we rely so heavily on our community partners. I think it's potentially a weakness of ours, but also as a result, I think really a strength of ours, um, is uh, we rely on boots on the ground, on people who already are building those relationships to then support their initiatives. Not to try to start something new necessarily, but to support those initiatives. So in Hillside, our relationship started with an existing nonprofit that was working there, um, Embrace Richmond, as well as the existing structure of the tenant council, and sort of using those existing um, players to begin to build our own relationships and be able to um, build some sort of authentic uh, relationship and community there that can then have folks come on base. I mean, I think a lot of you would agree that um, relationship building is the key to so many things, but certainly projects. Um, like this. I think the other thing is meeting people where they're at, um, both literally and uh, metaphorically. Um, coming to where people are at, showing them that you are committed and, and, and serious about this. Um, but also, you know, the example I use with um, Devante, who's in that picture, is at first, um, for me, a win was if he picked on his own the pretzels instead of the Doritos, right? So having him pick the crooked neck organic yellow squash um, instead of the alternative is not something I'm too worried about. Um, and there's constantly that, um, that interplay of trying to figure out, meeting people where they're at and growing sort of uh, authentically from there. Um, and there's, there's no uh, guidebook always for that. We're starting a prescription fruits and veggies program in Creighton Court. We're going to work with a focus of about 15 households um, writing prescriptions for fruits and vegetables, filling those prescriptions on site, and then supplying the resources and eliminating any barriers that are there. So whether that's cooking classes, whether that's nutrition education, whether that's recipes, whether that's actual tools to actually have in your house, whether we need to help get the right tools to have in your kitchen, to have a complete kitchen. What are you talking about? I mean, how do you pick these, who are you working for? Well, we're actually in the process of the next two months identifying the actual households that we'll work with. In Creighton Court. Court. using the Creighton Court Resource Center. Um, and the point I was going to make is we're trying to decide we want to provide some staples with that, those kitchen supplies. So cooking oil is, a, is a, something that we want to provide. And we're trying to figure out, okay, should we use olive oil because we know technically it's healthier um, and a better choice for cooking? Or we know that eventually we're not going to be constantly supplying this oil. And if we know that what's easier and more affordable and more likely for a lot of our friends and folks to use is going to be the vegetable oil, should we go ahead and just provide the vegetable oil to start with? And having that discussion, there's those, these are the type of questions that I, I come up all the time. I don't have the, the right answer for it. So I think part of it is being honest with people and saying, I don't have all the answers and I'm not here to tell you what the right answer is. I'm just here to sort of show you what's important to me and what we're trying to be a part of. And if it's something that works for you, we'd love to be a part of it with you. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, a lot of our conversations, you know, have been, you know, a youth-based approach, like let's target the kids, target the babies, you know, that type of thing. And, um, you know, I've kind of been feeling like that's uh, not so much always, it's kind of a paternalistic type of approach. And I was thinking like, you know, we don't really, look at uh, young adults, um, you know, early 20s and things like that in terms of how to get them engaged. And um, I think more so now, you know, uh, because these are parents, I guess, you know, the conversations with John Lewis, we talk about, all right, you know, the question about how to get people engaged in the conversation is always, it always falls back on the parents because, you know, you can get the kids around, you know, eating food and being, then being able to identify carrots and onions and things like that, but if they're going home and their parents are not really you know, invested in that conversation, then it's kind of, it becomes all for naught to a certain degree. Right. Well, and I think, I mean, there are, I think there are studies, sort of the seatbelt model that will show that, you know, kids are the way to get to the parents, right? Having the kids' behaviors change can maybe lead to parent parental behavior. 
But as when trying to get to the parents, I think we need to do a better job of having real alternatives for parents and be able to say, this can work. This can actually feed your family. This is how. This can actually make you some money, and this is how. Um, and I'm not sure if myself or others really have that hard evidence yet to be able to say or can make that convincing argument, and it should be able to be made, and it can be made. Uh, but to have a real alternative for somebody to say this is more than this sort of feel-good thing that we're doing building community But this is actually really about health outcomes economic development our livelihoods um, job creation uh, And so uh, those are models and that science exists and I need to do and I think we all need to do a better job when we're reaching our parents and saying hey This is real. This is not something that um, middle-class people feel good about and go do on a Saturday You know, this is something very real um, So Any other sort of yeah? Uh, actually, I think kid advocacy, advocacy uh, is is an excellent way to get the parents to do it because I mean, I mean, going to McDonald's, uh, you know, the, who who is who is saying, hey, let's go to McDonald's? Is the kids are so if the you know if the, if the parent and the kid are sitting there at the grocery store and the kid wants a bag of carrots for two bucks rather than a lunchable for four, I can't imagine the parent going you know having it having a problem with that at all right. I mean basically what they're advocating for is cheap is, is, is more more economical food yeah. so uh, you know it's like so I, I think that's a that's a great start at least I think you're right and even if that if they aren't able to get through their parents although again um, with tobacco and seat belts there is there are studies that say that's like the way we do it right is we work through our kids to change parental behavior um, but even if not at least we're planting that seed in the um, in the kid's uh, life. Other? Well, I just wanted to find out where your farm stand is on Southside. So it previously is at Reed Elementary School. And actually, John and I have to talk, John Lewis and I have to talk this year about how we're going to do this, whether he's going to be sort of independent on his own. Our, our ideal model is that we help uh, a, a community garden or a partner garden and an education program get going over the course of a couple of years as they get their own garden going and then we sort of supplement what they're growing in their own garden to sort of build that regular uh, customer base so they know there's going to be stuff there every week until they're able to provide that. Um, and John has a couple projects going and eventually we want to be able to step back and have him be able to sell his own stuff. Um, but our goal actually is to add one at Hillside Court this year. Um, is to add a farm stand either in partnership with Hillside Court or the, the school and have it um, be somewhere between Hillside Court and the school. And that's the next two months actually we're beginning to finalize our three locations. Um, and where is Hillside Court? Hillside Court is off Commerce Avenue, Commerce and Bruce. Um, you would take the Maury Street exit off 95 and then, or just off Jeff Davis there's Highway. A, there's a farmer's market, uh, a Latino farmer's market uh, at Broad Rock Park. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you have the south of the James. Um, the, the Reed Elementary, they have a greenhouse and the kids grow their own vegetables. So, but, but that's like from three to five. You know, so if you're not home from work yet, you know, it's mostly people come pick up their kids and, and buy the vegetables then. And the kids can, I mean, you have never seen children make a change so quick. You're talking <laughs> to end of buying vegetables. They've got a good team over there that we're very proud of. But John has done a great job and the kids have done a great job. Other questions or thoughts or just inputs and voices on why, why Urban Ag? with, um, I guess, uh, a 
of doing more or getting involved more. And what I'm really saying, would, or in your opinion, some of the things you brought up, would it help for us to, in some way, uh, educate, add education as a piece? I think education is, is so critical. On, 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 I guess, letting people know that. It was like that. <laughs> I don't know if I was using the right time to get off. No, no, you're no, fine. Letting the young people start seeing how it's not only um, conservative as far as the ecology uh, is healthy for you and all like that, but it also helps with us making sure that uh, we have the, I guess, abundance. Everybody has the right. abundance. Uh, well, I think with that education component, it's the real challenge, but also the real opportunity because it hits on all those angles you just talked about. It's not just as simple as we eat because we need to eat. Um, and you're, right. you're talking about all these different, very complex, but also very understandable, approachable, relatable, everyday implications that our food and our food system has for us. Um, and I'm actually optimistic as I see it integrated more and more into our schools um, and more and more into our communities with our most vulnerable citizens. Um, that they're going to be our best advocates down the road, I think, potentially, um, and who will see better than we see, I think, the um, broad implications this has and the uh, urgency of the problem. The reason I put it, Hillside Court, you got the, 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 um, the school, Fairfield Court, Creighton Court, you got the school. Kids walk through the, the neighborhood, and if, if they began to see this idea of, yes, we can use this plot of land. And otherwise, well, we see where they are. It's really, a, it's, it's beautiful. It? At, at, right where you're at, at, at yeah. Richard Woodville, like, the kids coming through, walking by from Creighton Court. This is a whole new, I mean, they didn't, you know, they've never seen a vegetable being grown. So just, and, and, and even any, the, the full grown residents. Um, I want to say that um, I, spoke to uh, John uh, Sidner's um, VCU class on uh, Introduction to the City. And those children, I mean, they were like 19, 18 to 21. They didn't know what organic was. They didn't know what a GMO was. I was shocked. Um, I, I said, you know, every dollar that you spend when you go even to a convenience store and you buy pistachios rather than a bag of chips, you change the way what they buy the next time. It's all scanned. They know what you're buying. So when you go for our Sobe instead of the Pepsi, you're changing the world with that dollar. You're and still giving Pepsi your money, but you are. Well, it is really interesting. People are really interested in different kinds of foods now, different international foods. I think Richmond is a food town. People go to the, you know, um, and even, it's even uh, crazier in D.C. I went up there and they said, what kind of Peru Peruvian chicken do you want? I went, I don't know. Maybe the heart of Peru. But, but that's something that brings people together. Food really does bring all sorts of cultures together. And, uh, and, um, and I think if you grow, just try one thing to grow, you'll find that you've never had an asparagus until you grew it yourself. Mm -hmm. You've never ate broccoli until you tasted one you grew yourself. It's a different taste. The broccoli you buy at the store came from California three weeks ago, and there's no life left in it. So it... I, I, I'm... Um, Kate Ruby, everybody. Kate, yeah, I'm Kate Ruby, and I, I work a lot over at... I'm, I'm market manager at St. Stephen's Farmer's Market, in case anybody is interested in a farmer's market. It's but awesome. I also, <laughs> yeah. but I also do a lot of work over at Green Elementary School, working with the families at Green, trying to develop some um, ur some urban agriculture and some community gardens at Green Elementary. Um, and I'm seeing some really there are, uh, three points I want to make. And the first is, is that I'm very impatient. I'm from the north, and I'm in my 60s. So by <laughs> God, <laughs> it's a deadly combination. I can see the end of the line, and I'm in a hurry. But I have to remind myself that this is not something that's going to happen. Oh, is it on? Is it on? Press the button. I can't believe I'm so not loud enough. I think I'm so loud. Oh, okay. Um, 
But anyway, uh, I have to remind myself that this is not something that's going to happen in a year or two or five or ten, but this is something, I, I just want to die knowing there's something in place that has the momentum that is becoming institutional or systemic such that there will be genuine change in terms of our food system by the time I die. I just want to see it there. That was the first point. The second is that I'm actually seeing some of these changes occurring um, at Green Elementary when I, um, I'm, I'm the secretary of their PTA. They, they, they don't have a functioning PTA. I'm their secretary. And I'm always the one who's in there promoting all this health initiatives. And sometimes I just have to back off because I am something of an outsider. At the same time, I found that at my latest PTA meeting, when we were talking about fundraisers for next year, somebody came in to do a presentation about selling cookie dough, and the PTA made the decision that they didn't want to do that. I felt like it was the biggest victory in the world. <laughs> so I did see some changes happening. There are, you know, it's just positive things that are occurring. It just feels like it's happening at a glacial pace sometimes, um, from my perspective. And the third thing I wanted to bring up is what I see as the comp composition of this room. And there is a huge population at Green that is not represented in this room, and that's our, our Hispanic community, which is huge, especially in this part of the city. And it presents some other real opportunities and barriers that need to be addressed, and that is a whole cultural community that we are very unfamiliar with in Richmond because it has grown so huge in such a short period of time that our, our institutions or our systems aren't, haven't really incorporated people for whom English is a second language. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the problems I'm having at Green. I would love anybody who lives in this area who's interested in working at our gardening project over at Green, I'd love to encourage anybody who's interested in doing so and be a part of that. And I would like to see more um, Spanish-speaking people involved in, in this entire program. It, they're there. They're, they, they exist. I just, I'm just having a difficult time tapping in. That was uh, one thing that we thought about for an economic opportunity. Um, there's age, a lot of Asians on the south side too, and you could really make some money growing um, Latino vegetables and Asian vegetables and selling them on this side. Uh, Tam, I mean, there is money to be made in that. And um, well, the Plaza Market is looking for vendors. Right, they don't even have people growing it, right? Yeah, there, there's a meeting. Um, there's a meeting on Tuesday at VSU. Is there a Richmond Grows Gardens Facebook page? If you go to the Plaza Facebook page, I had to get permission. I'm going to ask. The info is up there. The what? If you go to the La Plaza Market Facebook page, the okay. information is there. In the wow. I met. Um, I was at the um, Virginia uh, Association for Biological Farming Conference on mm -hmm. um, last week, and I met the guy from La Milpa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> La Milpa. La Milpa is um, a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, 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 um, they actually grow all this stuff out in um, Surrey. The, uh, the guys from La Milpa that um, are like integral to the Plaza Market, they actually grow out in Surrey County and then they come and sell at, um, um, well, at Broadway Park. So they were with the Virginia Cooperative Extension. And I just want to say that initially the whole desire to do the classes um, at Broad Rock Park was kind of like in the, in the uh, at Broad Rock Library was designed to try to address you know the fact that this area is a food desert um, and um, you know there's this huge Hispanic population but you know the man well was then like, do we need a do we need a um, we're not reaching I know but do we need an interpreter no there's a group there there's a group that um, there's a group that does that does um, translations for um, for for, uh, for, second, for uh, folks who speak Spanish, they'll come to your event, and you know they had a little microphone thing that they put it on, and then you know for the folks that are listening, they'll have an interpreter that'll speak 
the language for it. I was at the um, Defenders event, the, uh, the People's Assembly, and they had a Hispanic caucus at the, uh, and so they had somebody that was there from an organization that basically provided it. We could look into it. I think it's very important to get, you know, that community. And But then at the other end of the spectrum, you know, as far as just, you know, the African-American population in the city, and I brought up the Virginia Biological Farmer Conference because when I was there, it's like six, seven hundred farmers from all over the state of Virginia and, you know, surrounding states. And I can count on both hands how many black farmers I saw there. And, um, you know, that was kind of, it was, it, was, it was really like, oh, okay, I've always heard about, you know, that, you know, there's not that many uh, black farmers or whatever I may mean, have you. But just to see that so starkly, you know, and clearly, it was really like, it, it was kind of jarring, but it was like, okay, well, you know, we got a lot of work to do because of the mass migrations of people into the city. You know, a lot of these traditions have moved out. And then, you know, for, you know, many communities that are immigrant moving into the city, it's a, it's a possibility that those traditions will be lost, you know, right. all going, so yeah, definitely. Well, and you and I could probably talk all day about this sort of historical complexities and nuances that, that make that happen. One, one point to what Vicky was saying, it's one of the real strengths of urban agriculture. Um, Sally can sell to a restaurant six, two blocks from her garden. I mean, urban agriculture has a huge advantage in enterprise um, and reaching customers, and that you get to know your customer, you know your, 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 your mouths that you're growing for, and then you can be responsive and flexible to that. Um, and to Kate's first point, um, I'm also optimistic, but also know that it's slow and have to be patient. I mean, it took us probably, what, 70 years to get here. It was after World War II that we stopped sort of designing communities around having space for growing food within our cities. Um, and if it took us, I'm a, I'm a believer in gravity, so if it took us 70 years to slide down that hill, it's going to take us a lot longer to push the ball back up the hill. Um, but I think we're making, um, you know, significant progress. Hi, I'm a parent at Linwood Holden on the north side on Burnham Hermitage, and we have gardens for every single class at the school, and it's all done by the parents. And each class has a representative. We go out there and grow. And I'm my son's third grade class representative, and when we were out picking tomatoes last fall, we actually found a horn worm tomato and one of those big green worms, and it was the coolest experience. All the kids were really excited about it. The other thing we do too, and I don't know what all the other schools do in the city of Richmond, is we do a program called Know Your Veggies. And we'll take some of the vegetables that we grow and bring it to the class and show all the kids every month it's a different vegetable. Apples, spaghetti squash, which my son will eat at school but won't eat at home. So, uh, and I think it also just takes the parents to get involved as well. I mean, all of these programs that we have at Lionel Holton, it seems to me that it's just the parents that are doing it. And um, I think it's great. We also, my husband has his bees, and he's also done, come to the school and talked about bees to the kids, and I've talked about chickens. And brought a couple chickens to the school just to show that not all chickens are white. There are different color chickens and bring eggs. And um, I just think that it's important for everyone to get involved with it. And that's what's changing because all these kids are growing things in their garden plots and knowing that we have to have bees to grow the plants and things like that. I just think it's important for us all to get more sustainable if you watch things happening on the news where things are not available or I think that we're heading towards that direction. And Linwood Holton's a great program and sort of the Cadillac uh, school garden and nutrition program. And I guess the, the question and the challenge becomes, um, how do we take some of those models and make them replicable in schools without the resources that Holton has, without the two-parent households that, that Holton has? Um, there's plenty of challenges at Holton with an amazing support base. I'm, I'm yeah. constantly amazed at what great support you all have. Um, it's really impressive. I, I work so close to you all. Um, and uh, it's a great program, and our, the, the question is, what can we learn from Holden, and um, what's not replicable, what is replicable, and how can we bring those energies to other schools? I think Sally had, had something. And then there was somebody I'm missing over here, I think. Um, speaking to the Hispanic community um, that you're looking to work with more, um, I think we also have a huge refugee community um, right. that a lot of folks aren't aware of. 
And what's beautiful about this is that we have a lot to learn from these communities and that um, working in agriculture is a part of the lifestyle and food like so much for our families. Um, the celebration of food is something that we enjoy within our own families. It's true for the diversity of um, uh, communities and cultures. Um, and so what we can learn um, with the programs that we already have in place is very exciting. Um, when we talk about what we can do in the schools, um, my husband's um, a school teacher at Ridge Elementary in Henrico, um, and there is an apartment building that's adjacent to the school um, where there's a huge refugee community. Um, and they do an international night, and the fun that they have there with families bringing food um, and celebrating that. And my daughter, who of course is a big part of my work every day, um, went and asked some of the mothers that brought food, where they got their produce. <laughs> um, but it's that sort of thing um, that's exciting to see, um, and questions as Dominic's asking children, how did you prepare your breakfast? Um, as we start to think more about this. Um, to me, just going back to really the, the focus of this talk today, and we talk about what is urban agriculture, um, and Dominic, I think, beautifully addressed um, the multitude of things that our urban agriculture is. Um, I think that um, part of why we're seeing a rise of urban agriculture is it's come from the economic decline. Um, and it's exciting because um, I think that what so many of us want um, is to see an increase in self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think there's a more powerful way to be self-sufficient than to grow your own food. Mm -hmm. Um, and then to take that and celebrate it with your community. Um, the other piece of it that I think um, is just as important um, is the process. A lot of what we talk about is the end result of growing food or urban agriculture, and that's the food, the produce that comes out of it. Um, but the process of coming together um, as community members um, and as individuals, and working the land, um, watching something go from seed to food. Um, it's an incredible process, and the therapeutic healing that can happen for us as just one person and working that land, or as a group of neighbors coming home, coming together and doing that, is tremendous. So I applaud everyone who's a part of it. Um, and um, it will continue to grow. Um, it is slow. <laughs> um, I think that we learn from the seeds um, and that um, it, uh, it is a slow process and we have to be patient with it um, and celebrate that um, we don't want fast food. <laughs> we don't want quick fixes. And so we have to um, be patient and work with it and make it happen collectively. So. Another reason to be optimistic, I think, is that we don't, we're not relying on some new technology. We're not having, I mean, we are constantly innovating. Farmers are some of the most innovative people I know. Um, we're constantly coming up with new solutions, but we're not, we're not waiting on the next big piece of technology. A lot of the, I mean, a lot of the models that Elliot Coleman and Will Allen are using are things that have been used for 200 years that a lot of it comes actually from people growing in around Paris, learning how to do season extension in Paris in the 1800s um, that we're just now 200 years later figuring out these, these are the mo models that we really need to be using in our urban communities. Um, and these are how we can use our waste and our resources and our manure and our compost um, to have a, create a vibrant uh, cycle. Um, there was somebody over here that I keep missing. Maybe not. Maybe they left. I, I, was, I was just going to say that for me, like from, a, from more of an individual standpoint, the food just tastes better. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just tastes better. And from an urban agriculture perspective, I just think that people that live in an urban environment deserve to have the same sense of satisfaction and really an intimacy that you have with your food when you grow it, you watch it go from seed to plant mm -hmm. to, to fruit, vegetable, um, and then to consume it. So I think that's something that people just miss out on if they don't have the resource or the, the land they feel to do stuff. So I, I'm a big um, advocate for container gardening. I love container gardening. Um, I've done it, I've always lived in an apartment, I've always had a patio with, you know, a huge vegetable garden all in containers. So. Um, but again, it's, for, for me, it's, it's, it's important because I think that there's that the intimacy that people have with their food and then just that sense of satisfaction um, and really getting to understand where uh, the nourishment you put in your body comes from. So. I'm going to go to Pam first and back to you, Ron. Is that right? Is that okay? Yeah. Sure. You got one. Hi, Deron mentioned I'm Tamara Elmore, hey. and I 
I am a resident um, in the city of Richmond. I live in Highland Park. I volunteer at the Roots of Woodville Garden in Church Hill and also at the Hospitalville Community Garden. And I just wanted to share just a piece of my personal experience that I think kind of goes with this conversation. I started gardening because of a neighbor who noticed that I didn't have any flowers in my front yard. And, you know, he was like, you need to grow something. You need to do something about that. I live in my grandmother's home. She lived there for 40 years. She always took this great pride in her home. Her neighbors all know this. And then I move in and I don't grow anything. And so the neighborhood kind of said, you need to do something about that. <laughs> I started growing flowers because I felt obligated to do this. And from growing flowers, this whole community thing started happening. It was like encouraging from the community to keep going. From there, I started kind of thinking about a lot of things, like paying attention to what was happening in my neighborhood, how many people were walking to the grocery store that I would never shop at. I would never shop there because, you know, a lot of times the food is outdated that they have on the shelves. It doesn't smell right when you go in there. It's like they just put whatever in our neighborhood and expect us to accept that. And I'm like, well, what is it that I can do about this? I'm not satisfied with this. I'm going all the way out to Short Pump to buy my fruits and vegetables, but my neighbors don't have that same option. A lot of them don't have cars. They have to take what's available in the community. So then I said, well, let me start trying to grow my own vegetables. I know nothing about this, but I'm gonna start with some tomatoes and pots. That worked out well. It went to a little tiny garden plot in my backyard. Then it went to, now I have a plot in my front yard. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's interesting what happens when you are part of the community when you listen to what people say and what can come out of that experience. Now I'm able to share the things that I'm growing with my garden with people in the community. And when we started our community gardens, it's like people would walk by, but they would never get involved. But it's interesting when they see me coming from my house, going over to the garden, they're like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to the garden. I'm going to check and see what's going on over there. When they see me coming back from the garden with all these beautiful vegetables and things that we've grown there, now they have more of an interest and want to be involved. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just, you know, interesting what happens when you step out into the community. And sometimes it's just what people see you doing that will maybe motivate them to want to be involved. Most of the people that we hand out flyers to never come out to participate. But the people who kind of just happen upon it or see you with something that's of interest to you, those are the people that then are like, okay, I want to be involved because I want to get some, you know, what you have. And I have so many people come up to me in my front yard like, well, what are you doing? And asking me questions about my garden. And then that goes to, well, do you know anything about that garden at Hoskins Field? How can I get some of those fruits and vegetables from them? I'm like, oh, well, is that all I had to do is be a little bit more present outside, you know, and be available to the community. And now the people who want it are coming to me. And maybe if we just continue to keep going, we can build on that. And, you know, hopefully we'll just kind of learn as we grow. Tamara is a great example of uh, community gardener as change agent, as you just sort of described. And also, it gives you something to think about where you put your garden. The disadvantage of our choice at Hoshka's is we're behind the uh, behind Hoshka's, so you can't always see it. Um, and while we may be a little bit more protected there, we're actually, I think, it's a net loss because people can't see it. Whereas, Nathan Babers, Tricycle Garden, Roots of Woodville Garden, if you're anywhere near there, you see that garden, you know it's there. You're going to come up and whether you're going to go steal or whether you're going to go talk to somebody about it, either way, you know that garden and you want that access to that food. Um, so just something to consider when you're thinking about what the purpose of your garden is. If it's to get the community involved, don't go hiding behind a, a building or behind a big fence. Um, we're, we're about to wrap up. Just real quick, a couple of resources. Um, real quick, because um, we're about to dip out. Um, I know I know. we're a little bit over. All right, um, quick resources. Um, uh, spring, the time to plant is upon us. For those who are interested in trying to find out where to get organic or heirloom seeds, um, Southern, Ex Ex Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, their 2013 catalog is um, available. And you need to sit down, sit down. Um, and then um, 
awesome resource. I mean, just mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of well, hundreds of different types of um, varieties of vegetables, things I never knew existed, um, are um, available. And then also, um, So True Seed mm -hmm. um, from out of North Asheville, North Carolina, really awesome resource as well. Um, for those who may be first time gardening, there's a couple of good books that you can get. I just picked up this book called The Urban, the Urban Homestead. It's a really good guy, just um, touching on a lot of different things outside of just the gardening and growing with your own food, but just in terms of just living a more sustainable lifestyle in your home, period, really good. And then um, there's a... There's a lot of stuff that you find at used bookstores. I was at Stories Comics in the back, and I found um, The Sustainable Vegetable Garden by John Jevons. He's a really awesome author. talks about um, biodynamic farming, um, which is basically composting and you know healing your soil and then growing inside of that. But it's really easy. Don't be intimidated by it. You know, we built a six, we built 12, uh, 15 raised by, uh, four, six by four raised beds at McDonough Garden. And a six by four bed is a great size to get started. We don't even have to be that big. You build a four by four bed, just get four, uh, four by fours and put them all together and then dump some um, compost in there and you should be good to go. Um, yeah, uh, make sure you check out our website, rvagardens.com. RVAGardens.com has as many sites as we could find that are community oriented where you can go in and start growing your own food if you know you live in an apartment, you don't have a backyard, things like that, and you want to get outside. So um, it's a map on the site that you know you can click and try to find out what what place is closest to you so that you can um, connect with them and figure out how you can start growing your own food there. So that's a resource that we put up free of charge, you know, contact information for all the different sites that we can find. And if your site is up, up and about and you want to get on the site, let me know, email on the website, and we'll definitely get that up for you. Um, I just want to thank um, Sally. Um, it's from Tricycle Garden. She's the executive director. Um, she did it. She was speaking earlier. and. Um, and Kate um, from, well, she's now at St. Stephen's. There's a lot of people here with different projects going on. If you have one in mind, if you have a place you think you'd like to have a garden, please feel free to contact me, Richmond Grows Gardens. I can help you look at the soil. I realize this, there was a lot of theory, a lot of talking today, and we will get down to the nuts and bolts. Next class is Lisa Toronto, and she's going to teach you if you don't know, and that's why you're here. It's not hard. And so uh, I, I do want to give you a homework assignment, besides the fact that you have to take some of these eggs home with you. Um, look for a five-gallon bucket. Start composting. Save them rotten potatoes, and we'll try to um, start a few potato um, gardens next time. Now, I did, I bought um, a heat mat for my scents. Um, oh, God, it, 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 I, I had little broccolis in two days. And these are Jiffy Pots, and I'm, I'm not crazy about them. They're kind of hot. Uh, they were expensive. You soak them in water, I put a seed in them, and I had a heat, it's kind of a heat pad, a heat pad for underneath. I started them in a, a room with a lot of sun, and in two days I have little broccolis. It's time to start broccoli. So, you can use styrofoam cups and poke a hole in the bottom of them. There's, you know, I save, um, and it's kind of getting, I might end up on that show, The Hoarders. Um, <laughs> You know, McDonald's cups and stuff like that. So, and, you know, you like I said, you can make, um, we can make soil, we can figure out how to catch you soil, um, and we want everyone to feel like if you have a project or a school that needs a garden, please contact us because we have a lot, uh, a lot of people in this room do a lot of things in that, in the, in that nature. Also, if you work for a company, you know, um, Hanover County, Put a bunch of beds behind the government center for their for their um, employees, and so tricycle gardens. There's backyard gardens. If you have the money to put a garden in, we we can hook you up. You know you, you know you can come out and it's all done for you. So keep that in mind too if you're loaded. We, we, we can we got people that can do this. All right, it was nice having everyone and. Um, 
and you, I know you, it, 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 how many people saw this on the Facebook and how many people saw it on the website? Let's do Facebook. Oh, okay. And how many from um, the, the city website? One. Okay. All right, so we'll just keep on the Facebook with the updates. Next class is at Branches Baptist on Broad Rock, and the rest will be at Branches, except for March 9th, when we're going to Roots of Woodville, which is next to, uh, it's at 28th and Tate Church Hill. And we're going to have a um, oh, uh, um, rain barrel workshop and show you all how to put the seeds in the ground. And I don't think, we, we, we did have a work day, but it's snowing, right? Did they cancel it? Because we were going to Roots of Oakville after today, and to, they were going to have their own work day. But All right, it's glad to meet everybody. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Sally, for coming. Okay. Oh, and thanks, Southside Baptist, for having us.